everybody. My name is Marcus Hanscom. I am not a Roger Williams University graduate, although it's a pretty cool place. And now that I saw how many students have water views from their from their rooms, I was kind of disappointed I didn't select Roger Williams in my undergrad. Um, but uh, thank you for joining us this afternoon, and I hope you are all doing well and your family is stay, staying safe and healthy. Uh, it's a rather challenging time, and uh, welcome to my living room. As I know, uh, you're probably used to seeing this from colleges now. We're all working from home. Uh, so I want to give you a little bit of an overview of what we call our Bachelor's Plus program. So these are our accelerated master's degrees, and obviously you have some level of interest or you wouldn't be here. So I want to talk to you a little bit about those and kind of what the benefits are for them. And this is kind of universal across a lot of our programs um, if you choose to go on an accelerated master's degree pathway. And you probably don't know, I know the parents know for sure uh, that are on the line and, and for the students, many of the industries you're going into are going to require a master's degree if they don't already. So it's a good opportunity to be thinking about that. And, and I, I always laugh when I'm at undergraduate events and I have my table and parents come by and they say, oh, it's too early about that. And it's really, uh, and those of you that have gone through school, obviously you know how quickly that goes. Um, and given how industries are changing and obviously how we're having to respond to things like COVID-19, thinking ahead is really kind of important, uh, especially when you're coming into a college atmosphere. And particularly since you're on the cusp of starting your freshman year uh, in, in your undergraduate. So just quickly, a little bit about us, uh, we have 11 graduate programs that fall immediately under my responsibility at Roger Williams. Uh, we also have one master's degree program in our School of Law, and then we have two in our university college up in Providence for continuing ed. And I can tell you more about those later if you wanted to. We have about 320 graduate students within those master's programs. And then beyond that, we have about 450 law students. And so they work exclusively with the School of Law. I'll talk to you a little bit about the accelerated master's degree or rather the JD degree pathways as well um, in a little bit. Our main campus is in Bristol. I'm sure many of you have at least seen it at some point. I know right now it's tough to visit, but it's a, it's a beautiful spot. And uh, that's where a lot of our programs are offered. And then we have several that we offer in Providence and we have online options. And I'll talk through through each of the various programs that we have and what those deliveries look like. Um, and I know some of the students now that have been forced online Hopefully some of you have seen it's not the devil that we all thought it was going online. And uh, our faculty have learned that it's a pretty usable uh, medium. And for, especially for students who need flexibility, having online options aren't necessarily a bad thing. Now, I'm not saying that you all should go online, but you have that option down the line, uh, depending on what you're doing. So a couple of quick things about benefits of these programs. One of which is you start your degree your senior year in most cases. And Arguably, if you're an architecture student, you're actually starting a little bit earlier, preservation as well, because those are professional programs that have, or at least architecture in specific, have licensure requirements that are moderated beyond us. They're a national standard, and they require a combination of undergraduate and graduate credits. So your undergraduate credits are counting toward that licensure. And so if we have students that come to us, maybe they don't have a bachelor's degree in architecture and they want to become architects, they actually come to us and take nearly a year of undergraduate courses before they ever take part in the master's program. So the undergraduate courses in many cases fulfill requirements that are needed there. Beyond that, um, you have uh, the ability to take at least one, if not two graduate level courses in your senior year. And those will count both towards your undergraduate curriculum and your graduate curriculum. So you have some nice flexibility uh, with those. And, you save a little bit of money that way. And so if you're taking two classes, they're part of your undergraduate tuition, we're not, we're not charging you any additional money. And so that's net savings off of your graduate studies. And that's savings of time and money. So if you're taking two classes, in some cases, you're trimming up to a semester off of time in the graduate level. And you're saving, in many cases, about $6,000 in terms of actual graduate tuition. Beyond that, some of our programs offer some scholarships and things, and I'll talk more about that as we go along, but there's incentives for the students to keep your grades up as you go through your undergraduate curriculum because that's very important uh, to give you opportunities at the graduate level for additional financial aid. It also allows you, and I think students sometimes lose sight of this, parents can understand this more, but as you get out into the workforce, if you're able to get your degree done in a year, whereas many graduate programs are two years, uh, now architecture is longer because of the licensure requirements, 
but if you're shor shortening your time frame in graduate study, you're entering the workforce a year sooner, or you might be going to a doctoral program a year sooner and ultimately getting into the workforce down the line, five years down the line, uh, into the workforce sooner. And that gives you an extra year of earning potential. So we like that because we're giving students strong outcomes from these programs, but they're also earning their salaries sooner. So they're able to pay back loans that they've taken, taken them. They're building their career a little bit sooner. Uh, so that's one of the benefits of some of these plus uh, programs. We also will get you onto an advising track that many of you will be applying during your junior year. And so we'll be advising you on your graduate study during that time and throughout your senior year. So making sure that you're on track for the courses that you need. Particularly if you're thinking about your graduate study this early in your academic career, it's really important when you are here in the fall, talk to your advisor and tell them that you're thinking about your graduate program. And what that allow you to do is plan your undergraduate studies for the first two or three years of your program to make sure that you leave space in your senior curriculum to take the graduate courses that will count toward the master's degree. So sometimes students scramble at the end and maybe they've taken extra credits somewhere on the undergrad and so they have trouble fitting in some of those courses. It doesn't happen often, but if they haven't planned ahead for that, sometimes they have trouble squeezing those courses in. So some of the additional benefits, uh, we waive your application fee, obviously. Uh, we streamline your application process. In some cases, there are waivers of portion of your application. Uh, for our MBA, for example, we require a GMAT or GRE score, so the standardized tests for graduate school. We will waive those with students who have a 3.2 GPA or higher during their academic career at Roger Williams. So there's incentives, again, to keep your grades up and you can kind of avoid those exams and uh, they're a bear for anybody who's taken them on the call, especially parents, GRE and GMAT are not fun exams uh, and they cost a lot of money too. So if we can save you that, uh, take advantage of that. Our other programs don't require standardized tests, at least of the bachelor's plus options. So um, you can, but there are other streamlined ways to save you some time. Uh, it's also convenient. You're gonna be able to go right into your graduate degree we find that a lot of our students that stay with us, I think one of the most telling numbers, um, and I don't know the exact figure off the top of my head, but the number of students who stay from the bachelor's degree in architecture, for example, and go on to the graduate program um, of the graduates, something like 75 or 80%. Uh, so it's very telling. Some of those students aren't academically eligible, so there's a portion of those, and others are eaten up by really high quality master's programs. and. We're, we're happy for them, proud of them. Uh, Roger Williams has grown so much in stature that big architecture programs around the country have kind of stolen our students for lack of a better term, uh, but we're happy for them because it's a great outcome. But we have a very strong majority of students who choose to stay with us. And that's a testament to the experience that you'll have at Roger Williams. Uh, of course, students love the campus. They love the faculty. They love the experiences they have in their classrooms. That location on the water certainly is, uh, it doesn't hurt either. So. Um, a lot of students will stay with us. So there's a lot of advantages to that. Plus you don't have to go through all the additional hoops that other schools may require of you, including standardized tests to go on to their graduate programs. We also have, uh, as you probably heard through our undergraduate experience, experiential education is really at the core of what we do. And that's true on the graduate level as well, particularly with the bachelor's plus program. So if you like that experiential in nature, you know, education that gets you outside of the classroom get you really more engaged in your field. And whether that be study abroad or an internship or service learning or doing research, those things are continued into your graduate opportunities uh, that we have part of the Bachelor's Plus program. So we're really confident in the quality of the education that you're getting with us, the quality and the uh, satisfaction of the experience and ultimately the outcomes. And that's what we have to be most concerned about is making sure that you're getting a high quality job or getting into a top doctoral program uh, after you graduate. I'm gonna talk briefly about uh, each of the programs here, and I know that they won't apply to everybody, so I'll try to go quickly, but just give you an overview. Our Master of Architecture is a four plus two opportunity. And as you look around um, the country, there is, architecture is kind of funny because architecture typically is a, it's either a five year license eligible undergraduate degree, which is Bachelor of Architecture, or you have a master of architecture, which is a license eligible degree at the master's level. And there's also a doctor of architecture, which we see less students doing. Um, so if you wanna become a licensed architect in the United States, you largely have to get an MARC. And so we offer the pre-professional degree at the undergraduate level, the BS, and then the MARC is a two year uh, program. As I mentioned before, students who don't have a background have to take three years or even three and a half years to get the MARC done. 
So you're saving a year and a half of time and that's saving you money and all of that because of the coursework that you've done in the undergraduate level. So you complete 50, 56 credits, excuse me. Uh, it's a full-time program only on our Bristol campus. But it's in order to get the plus two option, you have to be a BS architecture undergrad. So you can't just go through another program and then get a two year master's with us. You have to get the BS program to make it into the MARC. It is an AB accredited, which is critical for your licensure. We have guaranteed internships for all of our students. And not only do we guarantee internships, we guarantee that we pay them. We actually pay through the university $3,000 a year, or $18 an hour. And it's designed to give students kind of seed money to go and work for a firm. And then most firms will pay students beyond that. So it's a great professional opportunity. We're very tied in to all the firms throughout the region. Uh, our location doesn't hurt because we're between Boston and New York City. We have access to the biggest firms throughout both of those cities and throughout the region um, in Connecticut as well. And so students have a lot, a lot of great professional opportunities. And for jobs, that means almost immediate placement for all of them, especially given that they have that paid internship opportunity throughout the duration of their studies. We also guarantee, again, with academic performance, if you have a 3.0 or higher, you guarantee a scholarship uh, coming into the program. So it's $7,000 per year. We also have study abroad opportunities. Those were a little upended this year, um, but typically students have the opportunity to go to Barcelona. And Beijing is one that we've had, but there's been less interest over the past few years. But Barcelona has been very popular. Uh, the undergrads go to Florence, so I'm sure you've heard of those. Uh, mm -hmm. We also have our Samsung Design Studio, which you can tour on the web right now, but if you've been to campus, you've probably seen uh, those facilities. Our Master of Business Administration is one of our newer programs. We just, we're graduating our, this is our second cohort, I believe, this year. It's either second or third. I'm losing track. Um, I'll call it quarantine brain. Um, but it's a 36 <laughs> credit program that we offer. Uh, and it's a one year MBA traditionally. So if you came off the street with an undergrad degree, say in English, and you wanted to go get your MBA, you typically would do a two year curriculum. So this is cutting off a full year of that. Um, I'll, I'll use myself as an example. I did my MBA at the University of New Haven in Connecticut, and it's a 48 credit program there. And I was able to waive a portion of those credits based on what I had done in my undergraduate. But every MBA will have a core set of coursework that all students have to take. And so MBAs are fairly standard. That's why they call them a professional degree. It's recognized what an MBA does, when, what kind of value you bring when you go into an employer with an MBA. So that they know you have foundational coursework in accounting, finance, marketing, statistics, management, and so on. So then those courses, if you have an undergraduate degree in business, you often have taken a lot of those foundational coursework. So like micro and macro economics would wave out of an introductory economics course at the graduate level. Uh, similarly, um, financial and managerial accounting do the same thing. So you're gonna be taking those as undergrads. So because of that, we are able to quote unquote wave you out of those uh, options. Now our program is only a one year program. So it's not like we have students coming in and doing a two year curriculum and they're working or other things. It's only students doing the one year full-time curriculum. So they call that a cohort. When you come in, you're gonna be with the same group of students that follow the entire program together. With the exception of a couple of electives that you'll take at the end where you have some flexibility on what you take, you'll be taking all of your courses together. You'll also do a study abroad. Uh, again, this year, unfortunately, that got changed. Um, but traditionally, we will go uh, for about 10 days over the spring break. First year, we went to Panama. Last year, uh, we went to Beijing, as you see in the, in the photo there, they were in China, the Great Wall there. Um, and this year was supposed to be China again. So I guess, yeah, it's our third cohort now that I can remember that. And um, really this is, when you think of an MBA, it's really thinking strategically about business. So it's really upper level business coursework. And an MBA is really relevant to every industry. You can go to anything from healthcare to, you know, Felicia's area, if you're thinking about marine sciences and running an aquaculture business, um, having an MBA is necessary. Um, any type of business obviously uh, would need that kind of background. So one thing that's nice about the one year MBA is whether you're a business major or not, if you are say a marine sciences major or you're an engineering major uh, or your psychology major, if you get a minor in business, that makes you eligible for the MBA. And that's really a great thing to think about. A psychologist is a good example too. If you're a psychologist, if you're a psychology major, you wanna become a psychologist, obviously you need licenses and other things down the line, but to get an MBA, you'll now understand the business behind running your own practice. So if you're gonna to have to understand how your accounting books work and what about tax implications, 
MBAs are going to give you some more flexibility and understanding what that that work is going to look like. So it's very applicable to all majors. The other thing with the MBA too is what's nice is within one, that one year we're packaging not only an in, not only a study abroad but an internship as well. And our students have done internships at Fidelity and Hasbro, um, some marketing agencies here. There's a Wheels Up, which is a private jet company. Um, and they've landed jobs at some of the big four accounting firms. They've, um, they're working, um, I know Hasbro just hired one of our graduates before she even walked uh, the stage this month. Um, we've got students that are doing uh, some financial work, financial sector insurance. Um, so a lot of major companies and industries that are hiring our students. And again, their placement is, you know, 80, 90% within a few months of graduation and close to 100% within six months. So very good placement. And I think those internships certainly open a lot of those doors. One of our other newer programs is our construction management program. We had it years ago. Uh, they launched it, unfortunately, during the, the housing crisis back in uh, 2009, 2010 timeframe. And uh, it did well for a couple of years and then teetered because because there was no construction happening. Uh, so we brought that back uh, two years ago, and that's a good option for students that have a construction undergrad. So if you're coming into the construction management uh, program or even engineering, architecture is also a possibility, but largely this is for those that are in the construction program. You take a couple of classes in your senior year that count toward that program, and you can do it in one year uh, as well. You have the option of doing a thesis if you wish. Uh, that's particularly if you wanna become a faculty member, maybe go into teaching long-term. And they've recently switched that program to be hybrid uh, in Bristol. So you actually meet every other week or you can do it fully online. And what's nice about the online component is if you're a student, let's say um, our engineering students get hired. <laughs> I mean, I, as I look back on my life, one thing I wish I had done is gone into engineering because the jobs are, it seems like infinite when they graduate. Uh, they get great salaries and they get placed before they walk the stage. And so that's lingering for a lot of students. So to think about going to graduate school, we know that that's kind of a debate for many of them. So to have a job in hand, you could still participate in the one year program online. So you could be working and participating online. Now that would be a very busy schedule because as you can imagine, these one year programs have a lot of coursework and a condensed amount of time. So you're very busy with your academic coursework. Um, so ideally you're pursuing them without working at least full time while you're in the program, but you have that option with these online programs. One thing I neglected to mention is that our MBA program is offered in Providence. So you do your four years in Bristol and then you'd be taking courses in Providence. Um, and that really opens up access to a lot of businesses and government agencies and so on. Um, our construction program is in our main campus in Bristol, but also uh, online, as I mentioned, and it's upper level. So it's less technical, it's less physical at the construction site. Uh, and it's more so in thinking about planning, strategic management, uh, interdisciplinary teams, financial planning and so on. Um, so it's really upper level when you're thinking about kind of expanding uh, into leadership roles in construction. One of our most popular programs of late uh, has been our four plus one in criminal justice. And one of the reasons for that I think is that the industry is shifting so much that if you want a federal job, most federal jobs require master's degrees now. So students often come to us and say, I wanna work for the FBI or Department of Defense or Secret Service you have to have a master's degree to open those doors. So many students are taking advantage of that opportunity. We've seen a shift in educational requirements for state police as well. Uh, while they're not requiring a master's degree necessarily, they are requiring bachelor's degrees in most cases now. So policing, fire, a lot of those public safety oriented uh, disciplines did not require uh, formal academic credentials. Uh, that's changed a lot in the last five to 10 years. So having a master's degree in criminal justice is nice. The other thing to think about too with these PLUS programs is if you go out into the workforce and you're tasting a salary, you're working, you're probably busy, most of us are working 50 or 60 hours now or we're not working a traditional 40 hour week, um, to think about going back to graduate school, particularly if you have a spouse or children later on as you're working, uh, going back to graduate school sounds pretty daunting. So if you do these PLUS programs, it gets you while you're in school mode to go right through and get these done. Um, so there's a lot of advantages to doing your degree uh, right after you complete your undergrad program. Now, the criminal justice program is a hybrid program similar to construction. It's, it's every other week that it meets, uh, or you can do it fully online. We've had a few students that ideally four plus one, you're going to stay on campus and participate in the, in the courses that meet on ground uh, because we want to keep that culture together. 
but in some cases students have had to go home for various reasons so they've relocated to other states and so they've kept participating but they've done the program online so it gives you flexibility if you have to you can switch into an online um, component pretty easily and these programs are set up so flexibly that you could actually be midway through a semester and you have to switch online immediately because COVID, for example, um, you can do that with these programs. We don't, we didn't have to shift much because we've already been used to a hybrid model and our on-campus classes meet in person. So, um, and they also broadcast them live. So if you're an online student, you can participate remotely in the live class or watch a recording of the class later on. So the hybrid courses really give you a lot of options if you needed to um, as your life circumstances change. The students who are eligible for this, I mean, you don't have to have a criminal justice degree. We've had students from legal studies, political science, psychology. So you don't necessarily have to come from the justice studies school. Many of the students do, but that's not a requirement. And we cover kind of two sides of criminal justice. One is kind of the nature and causes of crime and then justice system management. And it's really a, a combination of theory, research and practice. So it's a, a really nice blend of coursework. One of the programs that I, I came here to Roger Williams just over five years ago, and one of the programs that I shrugged about when I first walked into my interview was this preservation program. I couldn't quite wrap my head around what preservation exactly was. Uh, after I got here and, and saw really what the work they were doing, it's incredibly interesting, it's incredibly valuable, and it's something that uh, a lot of people are doing that we don't really realize they're doing. And it's really necessary across not only architecture, but engineering, transportation, um, you know, there's museum curation. There's a lot of different applications of preservation. Uh, so we are, we have the oldest undergraduate program in the country actually uh, in preservation. And I think it's the second oldest behind Columbia, not bad company uh, for our graduate program. And we recently switched to the preservation program to focus more, at least from a naming uh, convention to the hands-on work of preservation. There are not a lot of preservation programs in the country, as I'm sure many of you know, uh, but with the preservation practices program, one thing that separated ours from the few others that are out there is it's very hands-on. And you see that's one of our students working in one of the mansions uh, down, I think it's Marble House maybe, uh, down in Newport. And our students regularly work with Newport Preservation, uh, Providence Preservation Society, uh, local departments of transportation. I actually just talked to a student yesterday who's an alumni, alum of our graduate program and she's a historic preservation specialist for FEMA, and she's right now assigned or deployed, she called it, to uh, St. Saint, Saint Thomas in the U.S. Virgin Islands. So it doesn't sound like a bad gig to me, especially now. <laughs> so, um, so our students are doing some neat stuff uh, with preservation. So similarly, this is within the School of Architecture, so there's a lot of, it's very intertwined with the architecture program very hands-on with the work that they're doing. Uh, there's a number of labs, so you'll be out in the community a lot. And if you're familiar with the British Island, New England area, it's very historic here. There's a living laboratory everywhere you look. So there's a lot of opportunity for internships. Again, we pay our student interns uh, every year uh, for this program. So just like architecture, you'll get a guaranteed paid internship. You can also do an assistantship if you're interested in doing research with faculty. Um, but we have that living learning opportunity close uh, it's a historic town. Students have done a lot of work there. They've done a lot of pro bono work and helped with rehabilitating uh, buildings like the Armory in, in Bristol that are now being used for much more practical current purposes, but they kept the historical nature of the program. Um, some have gone on to National Park Service, um, museum creation, as I mentioned. So there's a lot of different opportunities. This is a full-time program in Bristol. As you know, it's the, it's the um, Preservation Studies program now, they've again renamed the undergraduate program. So this is a one year continuation uh, for that program as well. And if you want to, there is a study abroad option. Our newest four plus one program is our MA in special education. And this came about, we have uh, really an all-star faculty member uh, who we lured away from another local school, and I won't name drop, um, but he has started our, our program that, and the way that they built that program, the Rhode Island Department of Education is actually looking at that as kind of a model uh, for other programs because they did it so well. And really anybody who's going to teach these days in any classroom, K through six, seven through 12, uh, pre-K, Special education knowledge is critical because virtually every class 
as students on individual education, being able to understand the diverse needs of students. And this goes beyond the traditional thinking of what special education may have been, where you're talking about more physical disabilities. Um, but this helps students really understand uh, intellectual disabilities and differences, um, cultural differences, inclusion, those types of things. So it's a really all-inclusive uh, program for students. It's not an initial certification program, so it's not like somebody can come off the street and just get a special education degree and go become a special education teacher. You have to possess an undergraduate degree that's certification eligible. So in our case, students will go in uh, to the teaching program at the undergraduate level, and you would either be studying for elementary or secondary. Obviously, if you're secondary, you have a subject area. And as long as you're graduating, you're not going to graduate with your certification necessarily, but you will be certification eligible. And that allows you to join a special education program. And when you graduate from both, you essentially have a primary certification area. You get either K through six or a seven through 12 with a subject area. Plus you have a secondary certification in special education. And again, whether you're teaching history or you're teaching kindergarten, um, you're gonna have students that have their various needs. You might have paraprofessionals in your classrooms. Um, so understanding what the needs are of those groups is really critical. And it also gives you opportunity down the line Many students are thinking about becoming principals or some sort of leaders within their schools. Others are thinking about going into education policy. Having the special education degree really will separate you. And again, we're concerned about outcomes for students. We wanna make sure that you're marketable going into your classrooms. And right now there's a critical shortage across Rhode Island, Massachusetts for special educators. So having that background, um, and even if you're not from this area, if you chose to stay here, you have plenty of job opportunity in the foreseeable future. Um, but I'd imagine, depending on where you're going back to, you probably have similar demand. Uh, there are, there's far more need now for special educators and um, not enough people to do it. So having that formal training uh, gives you a nice benefit. We also, from a tuition standpoint, we discounted the tuition on this program down from our traditional tuition in most of our other programs, not all of them. Uh, but we decided we had the option to either charge high and then give scholarships to a select number of students, or do we give a reduced tuition that is equitable for everyone and uh, really acknowledges that teachers, unfortunately, are going into careers that are not as well paying as the value that they contribute. Um, you know, it's a little backward that we have basketball players making millions while our teachers are making 40 or 50,000 a year. Um, so one way that we're kind of acknowledging that reality for students is making it much more economical with their tuition cost at the graduate level. Uh, and we're also making opp opportunities to engage students of color as well with different uh, financial aid opportunities. Finally, I'll talk about the programs within our school of law. Uh, some of our students come to us with the interest of getting uh, a, a JD and becoming lawyers. And we have a couple of programs that really make that pathway attractive. And um, we'll cut off a full year of tuition and time uh, for students. We offer them both in business law and legal studies. We actually had a student who got very creative and she's graduating uh, this, in a couple of, or this week actually. Um, who did her undergraduate degree in legal studies. She did her JD, so she did the three plus three in legal studies. But we also have dual degree programs at the graduate level where we pair, there's four different programs that students can get a master's and a JD at the same time. So this student decided, well, why don't I just do that? So she got her legal studies undergrad. She got actually dual, I think she had a psych dual major in undergrad mm -hmm. in three years. She got her JD, and while she got her JD, she, dual, she got a dual degree opportunity with her master's in criminal justice. So she's graduating with a, from us with a bachelor's degree, a JD, and a master of science degree, all in six years, um, which is pretty impressive. Now, I, wouldn't, I would not encourage every student to do that because I can't imagine mm -hmm. she had much of a life outside of all of that stuff. Um, but there's some great opportunities to kind of double dip with the coursework that we offer um, for these. So you have both the legal studies and the business law pathway. In order to do the three plus three, you have to be kind of on that plan from the get go. So if you're thinking about becoming a lawyer, talk to your advisor and make sure you're on that plan right from your first semester. So you're taking the appropriate number of courses. Essentially, your first year of the JD program and these opportunities count back as your fourth year uh, in your undergraduate. And sometimes students I know are a little nervous. They're like, well, what if I want to graduate with my friends after four years and all of that? We're not, this doesn't take over that. So essentially, once you complete your first year of law school, 
you fulfilled the requirements for your, for your bachelor's degree. So you can graduate just like any four year student. And then your JD would only be two additional years beyond that. So it's a really great opportunity and saves you a lot of money. And again, gets you into the field a little bit sooner. Um, I could see students now that we offer the MBA using that business law opportunity to kind of craft in, you know, an undergrad JD and an MBA. Uh, so that's another great option if you want it um, as you're pursuing these programs. Just very quickly, these are some of our other programs that we offer. So as you're coming uh, forward as a junior, senior, you can certainly apply for these programs. And um, we give our students certainly the utmost consideration for them and have opportunities for considering um, uh, like forensic psychology, for example, is working on an additional plus one or a plus two opportunity, but would give you some flexibility. And I don't want to speak out of turn because they're not formalized yet, but there might be an opportunity for a three plus two uh, with our master's degrees in forensic psychology. Um, our forensic mental health counseling program has to be two years because it requires 800 hours of field work. So it's not something you could wedge into a year along with your coursework, uh, but it's a license eligible program. Uh, we also offer both an MA and an MS in cybersecurity. So students that don't have a degree in uh, cyber or information technology or computer science could take an MA in cybersecurity or they could get the MS if they're technically oriented. Our community development and our school finance and operations programs are available largely part-time out of our university college in Providence. And they have a lot of hybrid and online opportunities there. Our leadership and our public administration programs are offered through our School of Justice Studies but also our Providence programs that are offered full-time or part-time in hybrid or online formats. So all of the school, all of the programs within the School of Justice Studies can be done online or hybrid if you wish. And finally, our law school has the Master of Studies in Law, which is a professional credential that if somebody's working say in healthcare or in business and they wanna understand law better, they're essentially taking JD courses, but their goal is not to become a lawyer. Uh, if you wanna become a lawyer, you need your JD, uh, but if you wanna, be doing business law, for example, and really understanding the intersections of law and how it impacts your work, then the studies in law program is a nice alternative. Now, some of you, some of our programs offer kind of an early admission pathway, and that's true. Um, some of you, we have a select group of students that were kind of offered that pathway for the MBA program this year. We also um, offered a pathway for special education. There are still a few hoops to jump through junior and senior year, but we've cut out, especially if you've gotten that kind of early invitation, we've cut out a lot of the application materials that you'll need. Uh, and really it's what's critical for you now is to be thinking freshman year on, not junior or senior year on, you need to maintain your grades. You need to have a strong academic career while you're at, your, at the university. It'll help you with getting into graduate school for one. It'll help you with financial aid for another and really will open up the doors for these plus one or plus two opportunities. And that's true whether you stay at Roger Williams or go elsewhere. I've talked to a lot of students that they come to me and said, boy, freshman, sophomore year, I just, I was too into the social scene and I just was not focused on academics, but I really turned it around junior and senior year. For some programs that might be okay and we can look at your grades and, and see that you made progress and it might work. But for others, you know, that might be enough to kill your opportunity to go to graduate school. And um, I know that sounds crass, but I want to make sure that you're thinking seriously about if you're interested in graduate school, that you're focused on doing well through all four of your the four years. And ultimately, it means savings for you, financial savings and time savings. So those are important in the long run. So aim for at least a 3.0 or higher. As I mentioned, the GMAT or GRE can be waived for the MBA if you have a 3.2 or higher. For all of our four plus one pathways that have scholarships, we award scholarships at three, three or higher. So you wanna be shooting for that B plus average or better uh, to really keep yourself in the running for scholarships. Now, um, architecture has a little bit more flexibility. They offer at the 3.0 level, um, but be sure to keep your grades up. You're gonna largely apply in the spring of your junior year. And when I say spring of junior year, largely we're talking about prior to March 1st because we want to have you apply and ultimately have a decision for you in advance of registration time because then that allows you to plan with your advisor if you're taking uh, grad classes as part of the four plus one you're making your fall schedule uh, fit around having one of those grad classes and similarly doing that for the spring so you'll need to apply at that time and you'll work with our office and graduate admission uh, to do that 
the application materials vary by program. Pretty straightforward. Typically, it's letters of recommendation. It's an application. We waive your fee. Transcripts we get for you from the registrar's office, so you don't have to do that. And then some will have other requirements, like special education requires an interview, for example, or MBA requires a test score. Uh, so there's minor things that we'll work through with you. And then if you were offered one of those kind of more elite um, invitations into the MBA program, for example, we've waived portions of the requirements there as well. Um, but all of that detail was provided to you. And if you have questions, you'll certainly let us know. Now I've talked a little bit about the finances and I wanna kind of put a finer point on this because this is the most common, um, common question that we get when students are coming to us their junior or senior year, and particularly from parents as well. So we wanna be fully transparent with you so that you're not feeling like you're surprised when you come to uh, the graduate programs. All of the bachelor's plus programs inherently provide tuition savings. So right off the bat, um, you're doing one or two classes in your senior year that count toward the graduate program and your undergraduate program. So as I mentioned, for many of those programs, it's about a $5,000 savings at current rates by doing that. So we are essentially baking in a $5,000 scholarship for you. Then on top of that, a number of our plus one programs, as I mentioned, offer scholarship opportunities at the 3-3 level or above. So if you have a 3-3, a 3-5, or 3-8, those are thresholds that get you additional money. And so ultimately for, let's say, criminal justice, that program is uh, roughly $36,000 total um, over two years if you're doing it, but you know, in the one year program, you're cutting out about 6,000 in those first two classes. And then if you get our top scholarship, you're gonna cut out $4,500. So you're cutting out a third of your tuition by performing well academically and participating in the two grad classes senior year. So it's a really nice benefit. You're getting an entire master's degree for less than $30,000, which is a steal. Now, this I'm sure will grow. We typically, are, our um, tuition grows about three and a half percent a year. That's just typical cost of business, but we try to freeze that so it doesn't go any higher than that for students. And I haven't seen it higher than that. Um, so if you're planning ahead, if you figure three and a half percent increase, that's pretty common. So in short, your undergraduate aid package is not replicated at the graduate level. You do not just carry that right over. Um, and there's a number of different reasons for that, not the least of which is students pursue their graduate education differently. Some go part-time, some take a few classes here, but then they really ramp it up later. So graduate tuition, except for architecture, is priced by the credit hour. So if you're taking nine credits, it's nine credits times the prevailing rate. Um, so currently it's 984 per credit hour. And so if you're in architecture, you actually pay a semester rate. And I think that's uh, right around 19,000 now per semester. And that's before scholarships and things. So, and they're covered between 12 and 17 credit hours. So if you're taking a lot of credits or you're taking 12 credits or which most students start with about 12 credits in the grad program uh, or 13, I think with the studio, um, you're maximizing your tuition benefit one way or the other. So it's a fixed tuition uh, for them. So that undergraduate aid, unfortunately, does not carry over grad. However, grad costs are a little bit different. When you're thinking about undergraduate tuition, you know, typically a year of tuition is somewhere in the mid thirties uh, for, um, I don't even know our, our number for undergrad admittedly right now, uh, but some of our competitors are up in the forties or 50,000 uh, range for annual tuition. You're thinking about an entire graduate degree in the ballpark of 30 to $35,000. So, it's, uh, it's easy to get caught into that financial aid, like, oh, I want my aid to continue. But the reality is your graduate tuition overall is going to be less expensive and you'll have scholarship opportunities based on your performance. So we're happy to talk through all of that. And as you get deeper in your program, we can give you a full financial plan to show you what those costs look like. The other thing that is a little bit different for graduate is that, um, there's not the plethora of grants and like Pell grants aren't available. There aren't a lot of institutional grants. We have some that we do. Um, and the scholarships even are fairly scarce for graduate programs, but fortunately we have some with us here at Roger Williams. Um, but most graduate students, at least at the master's level are paying um, for, with student loans. And the federal loan programs actually are significantly more liberal for a graduate student because you're covering a lot of the costs on your own. And for the parents, just so you know, 
once your student becomes a graduate student, your assets and your part of your finances and your name on loans and all of that, they go away. So all graduate loan, loans are taken in the student's name only. And so on paper, that makes the student look poor, which is, is a benefit because that gives them more loan money. And so they can borrow money to cover the cost of their tuition as well as housing and food and books and all the things that they would have as expenses uh, in graduate school. So you have a little bit more flexibility in how that offers. We don't want you to over borrow. So we'll certainly coach students through that. But there's a far different availability for federal loan programs. They're priced very economically. They're lower interest rate. They have long-term repayment. And depending on what you're going into, so special education, uh, for example, if you're going and becoming a teacher and you're making 45000 when you graduate, you, are, you can do an income-based repayment plan for your loans. That's true of undergrad and grad. And you can pay over longer periods of time. And as you make more money, your loans can scale. So you have a lot of opportunities to do that. And we're happy to give you more details uh, if, you, if you have questions on that. And just very quickly, one of the things that we've noticed over time is when I came to, to Roger Williams five years ago, we were about 40% full-time students. So those largely were students that were 21, 22 when they entered uh, their programs. They were on a typically two-year pathway, and then they were off to their next endeavor. Um, We've now changed so much that we're close to two thirds of our graduate programs are full time students now. So that's changed the whole face of the graduate community on campus. And so we recognize that the graduate culture is a little bit different and the support needs are different. And um, you all, all the students on the line, when you're coming through, you're going to expect a similar experience from your undergrad as you go into grad. Now, granted, you know, you're adults and there's going to be other things like living off campus and all of that that you work out. Um, but we're doing a lot more now. We have a graduate student association, so we're doing activities off campus. We're doing more lecture series. We're sponsoring students to go to conferences. You're doing research, and if you get opportunities to present, you can apply for money uh, to fly to, get to your conferences, pay for some of your hotel, pay for your conference registration fee. So those things are all things that we've built a lot uh, the last number of years, and we have a provost research fund to pay for some of those things. Um, so we're doing a lot more for graduate students to enhance that community. Um, everything from happy hours to Providence Bruins, as you see in the photo there. We've done a number of shows at Providence Performing Arts Center. Uh, we were supposed to go to Blue Man Group, but unfortunately COVID uh, messed that up. We're going to the Red Sox in the fall. So we do a lot of things that kind of increase that community that are really important a lot to those full-time students. So you'd be able to continue a similar campus experience uh, in your graduate study. We also have things like as I mentioned for experiential education, doing research, especially if you're going to PhD programs long term, you have a lot of good quality research opportunities. You also have internships, study abroad. Um, so a lot of things that really engage you both inside and outside the classroom. And one thing to keep in mind too long term is that um, many juniors and seniors have moved off campus anyhow, uh, not all of them, but many of them have. So by the time you get to graduate study, you'll be living off campus. We don't have graduate housing uh, on the campus. Uh, which is a good and bad thing. Sometimes students just want to have a place that's their own that's on campus and don't have to commute. Um, but you can live very close by and you know the benefit is being an adult is you can kind of separate away from an undergraduate experience and um, kind of take advantage of whether you want to live in Providence and have kind of the bustling social life there or live in Newport or you could stay close by in Bristol which many students opt to stay in Bristol because they love it um, but it's close by to campus and you can be on the bus line and move shuttles and all that kind of stuff. So it's easy to get to campus but as a graduate student you'll be living uh, off campus. As you're doing your research and things, I invite you to look at us on social media. Uh, right now, if you go over to ins our Instagram page, we're starting to celebrate some of our graduating students. Uh, unfortunately, they don't get to have a commencement this year. We're still trying to figure out how that's going to look because we tried to move it to August and now uh, our governor has banned any large gatherings through the end of the summer. So that's unfortunately changed those plans a little bit. So you can kind of learn about some of our graduates and what they're doing there. We're also on Facebook and LinkedIn, so you can check us out. And they'll give you an opportunity to just kind of see into the life uh, of, of what it is to be a graduate student and what our students are actively doing and, and what we're really all about. And so with that, um, I'm happy to take any questions. I hope that was helpful for you. I talk a lot. Hopefully I didn't go too far over time. Actually, I went significantly over time. I apologize, but uh, happy to answer any questions you have.
Uh, if anyone has any questions, you can feel free to put them in the chat um, and then Mar I can filter them to Marcus um, or I can answer them as well. Um, if you want to take yourself off mute, you're also welcome to take yourself off mute and ask a question. Um, you can ask anything about, you know, graduate programs, anything Marcus mentioned, if you have any questions about undergraduate programs, um, anything along those lines, feel free to ask. Oh, someone said very informative and thank you. Thanks for joining us. <laughs> well, that was helpful and it wasn't totally boring. <laughs> Any questions at all about the experience at Roger Williams? I know that's the troubling thing that we're all remote and if you haven't had a chance to visit campus now, you're kind of struggling with, you know, you haven't been able to physically stand on campus, so that's a little challenging. If you like the water, you will love it here. I will say, I will say that. Very true. <laughs> Um, is there a program for engineering? Unfortunately, not right now. Um, the only engineering program that we have at the graduate level is construction management. So um, you know, I'd like to see growth in that area, but I know right now um, they've been focused on even further enhancing the undergraduate programs. If you're an engineering student and you haven't seen our new building, definitely check out the video tour on the undergraduate admissions site. Uh, it's a really fantastic building, uh, but they've really invested a lot of their time and resources in enhancing the undergrad experience even further, and uh, which I think is fantastic for you all as undergrads, but it doesn't help me to provide a graduate program for people that want to continue. Um, but I think you'll find too, uh, especially with engineering, I mentioned it earlier, you're going to get a fantastic job that pays very well right out of undergrad. And mm -hmm. uh, as much as it doesn't help my case when I'm trying to get more students to the university, um, one of the nice things about grad admissions, and I'm not, I don't mean to disparage Felicia or her team, um, <laughs> but I worked in undergrad admissions for a while and I can, I can say this, um, when you're standing at a high school table, you can say, oh, don't go to that school. We've got better XYZ program or where we have better pizza close by, you know, there's, there's things that's a little bit more competitive with the undergraduate experience, um, because you're going to school because you're not only for academics, but you're broader campus experience and growth and all of that. Um, but at the graduate level, you're selecting a program based on how it's going to get you from point A to point B. Mm -hmm. And that point B might be different for every student. Um, you know, I have forensic psychology is a good example. I have students that come up to me and say they love CSI and they want to become profilers. That's really not what forensic psychology is as a discipline. So our program is very true to what the discipline of forensic psychology is. So when you think about profiling, that's more criminal justice and federal and that kind of stuff. So I can sit with a student and say, we're not a good fit for you because of what you want, but Marymount University or George Washington University is a good fit for profiling because that's something that they do, right? So at the graduate level, I can kind of advise students a little bit differently and I can help the students that are gonna be good fit for us. So that really, as you're selecting an undergraduate program now, you're thinking about fit in terms of your experience more broadly, but you're gonna be thinking about at your master's level, you're picking a degree because it's gonna get you that job or because it's gonna get you a promotion or because it's gonna get you into a doctoral program. So long story longer, as an engineer, if you're graduating and getting a fantastic job, most firms out there have tuition remission programs and a lot of them want to train you anyhow on their own practices. So if you have a great job like that, I don't blame a student for going, taking that job, work for a while and then have them pay for your degree later. You don't need to plow right into a degree at that time. Um, so engineering is a little bit different because there's so many opportunities available to you right as a senior. Um, now in four years, that could be a little different. They might be looking more at master's degrees, but I always encourage students to take advantage too of those tuition remission programs if you have a company that's willing to pay for you to go to grad school. Thank you. Um, the next question is, uh, is there anything for psychology or biology? Biology, not right now. I mean, we have a pre-med uh, track that Felicia could probably speak to a little bit differently than I can. Um, and there's a partnership, I believe, what's the University of Albany um, for, yeah. but that's more the pharmacy. Farm, the farm D program, yeah. So um, as far as biology goes or marine biology, environmental science, we have all the pre-professional tracks. So pre-med, pre-vet, pre-dentistry, pre-optometry. 
um, anything along those lines that you would need to go to medical school for. Um, a degree in biology, a degree in chemistry, a degree in biochemistry, a degree in marine biology from Roger Williams University will get you to that next step. And you'll work with an academic advisor that's versed in the pre-professional track so they know which classes you need to take. They know about you know, the exams that you need to take and they can help you find a graduate school and a graduate program. Um, so you'll be on a pre-health advising track and, and any of those majors I mentioned will kind of help you get there. Um, in general, as, as far as research goes, we have a ton of research opportunities as an undergraduate at Roger Williams. Um, from being a marine biology student, I was involved in research starting my second semester freshman year. So I did research pretty much all four years on campus and, and got to use a lot of different equipment or a lot of different techniques. Um, and it's like that across the board in a lot of our science majors. So you have that experience when you're going you know, onto your next step whether it be a graduate program or it be going to medical school, um, you have a lot of different experience that you can bring with you from the, the science side for sure. I'm glad, glad Felicia brought that up because if you're interested in long-term getting your PhD, mm -hmm. you really have to be thinking about research now. Um, yeah, you're not sure. gonna do a lot of freshman, sophomore research. You might dabble a little bit, especially if you're in sciences, but junior and senior year, especially, and you mentioned psychology. Mm -hmm. you know, psychology students are gonna do typically um, good research undergrad program they're going to do a research proposal in their junior year and then typically a research project that's going to be thesis like um, their senior year so when you graduate you're coming away with a um, a quantitative a, an empirical research project that you've done where you can actually demonstrate that you created an instrument collected data and analyzed that data and presented it and that's something that as you're going to graduate programs having that is important especially to doctoral programs to show that you have that kind of quantitative background. So selecting a good research program, regardless of what discipline you're in, is really gonna be helpful to you if you're thinking about PhD long-term. And PhD is obviously, you're thinking teaching as one of the obvious places, but if you're thinking about any sort of research or lab work long-term, especially bio, um, doctoral programs can be critical. Now for psych, unfortunately, we don't have anything in the bachelor's plus programs right now. We had a four plus one in forensic psych. Unfortunately, it had too many grad classes really wedged into the senior year to make it easy for students to do. And I don't mean easy in terms of rigor, but it was a lot of stress and a lot of extra classes and students just struggled trying to do it. So we took that program off the table. But as I mentioned before, we're talking about uh, three plus two pathways. So you might actually be able to get your undergraduate degree a little bit sooner and then do your master's degree because the master's programs in the forensic and legal psych program, that's a heavy research program. The goal is to get you into PhDs. So you have to do two years of research there. Or if you're in the mental health counseling side, you're doing two years with 800 hours of practicum and internship so that you're ready for getting your license. So um, they have to be two years at the graduate level. So we're going to try to shorten the undergrad but give you still a plus two opportunity, but a shorter undergrad and you'd still save a full year of study. Great, thank you. Um, does anyone else have any other questions for Marcus or for me? Okay, so it doesn't look like anyone else has any questions. Um, again, thank you guys so much for coming today. Marcus, I don't know if you had any last minute things to say, um, but otherwise we can, can wrap up our, our session. Well, thank you, everybody. I appreciate your time. And please use me as a resource now or in the future. You don't have to just talk to me when you're applying. Um, if you have questions about grad school at all and just need some advice about grad school prepping, even if it's not at Roger Williams, again, we're not pushing you here. We just want to be a resource and support you in anything you need. Great. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for joining, Marcus. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Have a good day, guys. Thanks Bye, everyone.